It's lovely to be here with all of you. Um, I've been rather nervous because, as I'm sure you've noticed, as the media begins to diversify into finally a healthy set of different um, ways of seeing the world, you can get your heart shattered um, as we have those debates. So, so I've come here today wearing a hat and a t-shirt because I think all journalists wear a hat and a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> my Bafana Bafana hat because I love backing losers um, and because I'm here today um, because I also I, I'm going to back what for me feels like a losing philosophy and that's the philosophy of non-racialism I think it's about as popular as non-racialism about as popular as Bafana is at the moment but I'm going to do my damnedest to do so so I think the reason that the room is so full is because of this huge debate about whether journalists should wear um, politi party political paraphernalia. Um, part of that has been that if you don't, then you're just kind of this amorphous, apolitical being. And the reason I chose my t-shirt and my hat is to say absolutely not. I fully accept that all journalists have got politics, that we come from somewhere, that we have things that we believe in. So that hat I, um, I bought, it is the official Bafana hat, but turn it inside out and inevitably what's there? It's made in China. And this uh, t-shirt here is, it carries the figure of uh, Steve Vicker, I'll tell you why in a little bit. But it's bought from an entrepreneur who runs a shop called um, the T-shirt Terrorist. So is it an act of appropriation? Inevitably these debates are very, very political. Now to the topic at hand. I think that media and race is quite a biggie, and it's given to gigabytes and columns of very, very hot air. Yet it is the single biggest debate that I find our readers at City Press want to opine on, whether they're black or whether they're white. And generally, I find it to be an anemic and sometimes a terrifying debate because this is how it goes. So whites generally want us to just move on. Let bygones be bygones to be a shallow, happy, rainbow nation, and just please do something about the potholes. So blacks, I find, are generally like, oh, okay, just a minute there. My life hasn't changed focal, and yours is just as nice as it's always been. This is, of course, the white privilege debate. In fact, your life is better, so no ways am I moving on. And I think this is the debate that we host day in and day out. And I think it's unfortunately exactly where the media debate starts and where it stops, at these elite concerns. It's why I think a relatively unsophisticated political thinker lets loose on Twitter and the nation stops in its tracks. Why? I wonder why the governing party took Zelda Lechranchi so very seriously. And I wonder why I took her seriously, and I wonder why you took her so seriously as well. So I think we've not even begun to tackle the very tough questions of inferiority and superiority complexes that abound. I think that the era we're in demands a psychology of liberation. And the Zelda moment crystallized for me um, what I've been thinking about. And that's that we definitely need a Steve Biko for the 21st century. Is this, is this is an idea and a furrow that I think we should be plowing, the psychology of liberation. And I'm about to start doing so with the help of some friends in the room here. So back to the debate as I see her every week. You tell me when to stop it. Eh? As I see her every week in my inbox, it goes something like, <clears throat> it usually is packed in with research that suits your point of view. So successive income and wealth surveys reveal that the gross buy cuts skewly across racial lines. Absolutely, I acknowledge that. It's also true that our boardrooms um, in corporate and even in the, ac the academies um, in South Africa's mahogany rows have proved impermeable to change. And I think that it's only this that sets up our world of cross-racial bumper cars. Um, the only place, the, the places include the boardroom, the workplace, the schools. So the big debate about Kuro um, that, that we were talking about last week, the low-fee private schools, is how we tackle the, the race debate. Only sticking at the edges of the suburban complexities of trying to live together. And that's where we start and that's where we stop.
These things are highly complex and they're often hurtful and they're very real. So when I was going to become the editor of the Mail and Guardian, three of my colleagues who were white and much loved by me went to the board and said that no, um, there's no way that she can become editor. She doesn't have the balls for it, which in a sense was true. But what they were actually <laughs> saying, but, um, but what they were also saying is that really black women are not ready to edit. It took a lot of hard work for me to win them around and for us to establish a team, spirited, a team spiritedness. But I don't think that that's the stuff that the media should be really writing about or be so absorbed by. So not for a moment am I saying that the racist Sunette Bridges, the skewering of Steve Hoffmeyer, dealing with the whack jobs who beat up domestic workers, or white men with fists who fly into a rage at an ATM like they did in Cape Town, I'm not saying they shouldn't be noted and quoted in the media. I think it's vital that you tackle their racism, but I think that that's the easy stuff. The HRC, the CCMA, the parents of Curo show us how that can be very easily dealt with. I think, though, that what's crucial for me is that we don't reflect that a research which shows a different sense of blackness because it's not something that's convenient. So take this. There are now more black middle class people than there are white middle class people. The uptake of black ownership of pension, provident funds, unit trusts, and prop property has been truly phenomenal. But that, I don't understand why. It's a story that we turn away from. Um, this, this coming into being of a very strong group of people. Yet, if you listen to our race debate, it's almost as if nothing has happened, as if we have gotten nowhere, as if the struggle was for nothing, nothing has shifted or changed, as if there are still equal numbers of white and black people in South Africa. That's the tone uh, the debate takes. And that our solution lies that if only all this white wealth and privilege um, was given to black people or transferred to them, then everything would be hunky-dory. In fact, that's very, very far from the truth. The numbers will show you that. But it has become the shorthand for what we in the media and I think you in the public call transformation. But in fact, it should be much deeper. So just two examples, if I may. I think Marikana shows us a picture of where the real transformation and social justice debate should be. So Lonman, should, does, will foreign capital ever do right um, in the extractive industries? What does it tell us about transformation and BEE? Um, what did Cyril Ramaphosa why, what did Cyril Ramaphosa do on that board for so many, for, or for over a decade? Um, why didn't he implement the social and labor plans? Why did miners, why have miners become so indebted? And what does it say about the complex truth of sustainable livelihoods um, in the Eastern Cape? Um, that the PPC story we've presented as a battle between um, Traposa Romano and, and Becky Sibia um, versus Ketso Gordon. I think, in fact, it is a story about what does transformation look like. On the one side, do you share more with the workers, or do black executives need to get the same as white executives previously? There's a whole area of state capacity that I don't think we look at, um, because I think the mirror of what state capacity says about black companies is too hard for the media intelligentsia, intelligentsia to inspect and see the impact on education, on health care, on an agriculture. I think those are areas we don't even go to. So just as I conclude, so I think you've set up a beautiful um, Rainbow Nation panel here, but then you demolish the idea of the Rainbow Nation and its attendant qualities of non-racialism and diversity. And that, too, I find to be a, a theme in our public debate that, that I abhor, because it goes that, because I think our freedom, our peace, and our stability were incredibly hard won. It wasn't a sellout, as is often presented in the race, race debate. It was a victory. And I don't think non-racialism is like singing kumbaya um, or, or, um, or something just a palliative. I think it's a constitutional principle, and we in the media might start better using it to harness the kind of race debate that you spoke about. Sorry for taking a few minutes longer. Thank you very much. Thank you.